Today we begin a focus in the study of the book of Nehemiah, a man who God called to rebuild. There was a time of great destruction in the life of Israel, and they had been uh, out of order and captive, and now they were returning to their homeland of Jerusalem, but the walls were broken down, and it was easy for enemies to find their way in and to plunder the work that God was wanting to rebuild. And in that, God spoke to a man to say, let's do something about it and let's rebuild. And that's really the word that's on my heart today and for this year, 2023, let's rebuild. There's been a lot of challenges. There's been a lot of destruction and God is in control and he is amazing. And we're coming together to say, God, what do you want me to do? And so the theme of today is a question, who cares? Who cares? Some people don't, and you do. I know that's why you're here, because you have that deep abiding desire in your heart to care, to care about Jesus, to care about others, to care about making him known in our community, to care about the work that God wants us to do in the city, who cares? My introduction to today's message requires a a bit of a family talk. There are times in families where you just need to get around the dinner table and set the time aside to say, hey, let's, let's circle up. Let's talk about where we're at. And today is an opportunity for that. We've come through the fall season, the Christmas season, the Thanksgiving season, so much focus that goes into that. Now we're in a brand new year. It's free of clutter, of other focuses, and it's an opportunity for us to have a chat, have a family talk. I want to share some things with you of just where we are in the journey that is the introduction to today's message where we're going to study very carefully the first chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Our mission statement, we state often, it was stated again in the video that we watched a moment ago, to live as Jesus among the broken, through word and deed, telling people about Jesus and teaching them to follow him. We are on point with our mission. This is who we are, it's what we do. From the streets of Sacramento to the penthouse suites, we're here to live as Jesus among the broken. We walk life out with broken people. Brokenness isn't about someone that's in trouble on the street. There are people that are in safe places, people that are in wealth, that are broken inside. We are all broken in some way, and Jesus wants to come into our brokenness and bring healing. We can live life out with people no matter what the social strata might be. The joy of the journey is that Jesus heals our brokenness. That we're here to celebrate. Jesus heals our brokenness. Part of our mission is our school. It's a training ground to equip the next generation to change the world. Through word and deed, our students are being taught how to tell people about Jesus and to teach them to follow him. We've sent hundreds and influenced thousands of people through our school over the years. It started in 1977. Here we are 45 years later, still working to equip and train young people in the way of the Lord. And now we have adults all over the globe, literally, that have come through this training ground. Our school is financed through tuition that is required in order for students to attend. Yet there's always a gap in private education between the revenue produced and the cost that it takes to educate a student where most private schools have fundraising efforts to fund that gap we've studied them around the city and around the country literally everyone has a plan for raising additional funding that doesn't that helps to cover what tuition doesn't cover Where most private schools have had that effort, we have funded the gap in our school through the surplus revenues of our churches. Part of the joys 
of what we've had over the years is such a flow of life within the life of our church and how our school is a mission that's part of the mission effort that we do. We support missionaries all around the world. One of the greatest mission supports right here in our own backyard is our school that is sending people to the world. And we've made that a part of our effort and we've had the ability to fund that gap through just the regular flow of, of life. COVID changed all that. It changed our model. The model we've operated in since 1977 suddenly was interrupted and in 2020, from the spring semester when everything was shut down, students were not coming to classes, doing online education for the last three months of the year, going into the summer not knowing what would happen in the fall, parents not sure to pay tuition if their students might still be at home. We were able to pivot and work with the county health department to get kids back in school in the fall with a couple of starts and stops. They came and visited our school. We worked with them to say, we can follow your protocols this way. And they shut us down a couple times and then signed off and said, no, you're doing it right. And they gave us the go ahead. And we were one of the few schools in town that actually had students on campus for the early part of that year. But in the summer and in the interim, we had a drop of 200 students in enrollment from the spring to the fall of 2020. That equates to about $2 million in revenue. That's a big loss because we still have all of the teachers that are in place and can't pivot that quickly in the process. And it created a, a bigger gap for us that was a great challenge in that moment. In the fall of 21, we gained 200 students back. Just one year later, we picked up those 200 that had left in the prior year, and we were seeing tremendous momentum going in the right direction. However, in 2021, we saw a loss of revenue in the church ministry of about 25% from what we had had the prior year, simply due to coming back out of COVID. We had not had public services in the house for a few months when we finally were able to get back to that, thinking that everybody's gonna come back when that day comes. It was a different experience. It's been different for many, with some exceptions in various places around the community. From the beginning of the pandemic, we gathered our elders to seek God for what we should do as a church. I don't do these things alone. We have a team, we have a board, we have elders that are spiritually focused, and we find that there's wisdom in the counsel of many. We follow the scriptures in that kind of processing, and we did that very diligently and have, still are, every step of the way along the way. 80% of our elders were united around the conviction that we should honor the leadership of our city and our county. What the health department was asking us to do that we should follow. Saying that, 80%, there's 20% that have a different point of view and that seems to be the nature of life that we live in these days. We walk with the wisdom of the majority and lean into what is seen as this is what God wants us to do and it was not for selfish reasons it was for careful thoughtful reasons about how we care for one another how we care for the welfare of everyone in this house how we're walking this out with the wisdom of those who have the job to keep our community safe and we want to make sure that we're honoring the Lord in every way in that process. And so we walked that out in that way. We leaned into our ministry with passion. We did not shut down. Sometimes people talk about churches that shut down. It's just the wrong language to use. We didn't have large group services in person, but we were active. In fact, every Sunday from the beginning of COVID until today, I would come here on Sunday, right to this spot where I'm standing, and I would bring a message for that day, for that week, 
right from this location and we would capture it. There was maybe 10 people in the room that were required in order to capture what we were doing and me looking at a camera thinking of you, watching wherever you might be watching from, whether it be from home, from your phone, from who knows where, but thinking about you and delivering the truth of God. We, we made trips around the community to visit people. We, we dropped off gifts for children to make sure that our children's ministry were staying connected to children. We were active. We didn't shut down. We were redoubling our efforts in different ways. Though we weren't meeting here as we were following what we believe was the right steps for us to take in the journey. We could not gather to produce the singing Christmas tree, something we had done for 63 years. 63 years in a row, think of that. And I was here for 25 of those 63 years. Every performance, sharing the gospel, inviting people to respond to the message of Jesus. We couldn't have public meetings in 2020. It was impossible to have that event in 2021. Leading up to it, we still weren't supposed to be having choirs meet together and be singing on top of each other. We couldn't do it for two years in a row. This year it was possible to do, but after all of the change that occurred in that season in between, we didn't have the, we didn't have the leadership that we had had before and the participation to make it work properly. And sometimes there's seasons where you feel like, you know, it's all right to let some things go. And we let that go, but there's some who have a hurt because of it because they were so invested in it. I understand that. I understand it well because I'm invested in it likewise. Those are hard things, hard decisions to make. And it's one of the processes that we've been through. Some grew impatient during the months that we were following the county health department guidelines for what to do. Again, opinions all over the map. Can you imagine trying to figure out what to do from the leadership point of view where people have opinions on all sides of things, some who really are in the health work? We're talking to doctors. We're talking to nurses. We're talking to epidemiologists. We're talking to people that it's their, it's their task. It's what they're trained in that are giving us guidance. And then there are others who are listening to other voices and think that We've become experts because we can do research on the internet. And with all of the things that we can do, we get various opinions going and everyone's opinion believes it's the right opinion. Everyone who arrives at a point of view is just convinced that I know. And yet those opinions are polarizing and, and all over the map. This is the life that we've been walking through. This is the brokenness of the world that we've been walking through and it's still, it's still trying to find its way, our world, in regard to these polarizations. Some had different convictions concerning the decisions being made. Our goal has remained the same, remained the same every day. We want to honor Jesus. That's our conviction. We want to honor Jesus every day. We want to honor Jesus in every decision. We want to honor his word. We want to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. We're imperfect. I'm a human being. <laughs> That's what I am. What are you? You are me. You're a human being as well. We're all, we're all flawed. We're all unique in how we're put together and we're trying to figure things out. And sometimes we think we know and sometimes I find the older I get, the more I thought I knew that I think maybe I don't. It's quite the journey of learning and continuing to learn as we go. We're imperfect, finite beings attempting to follow a perfect, infinite savior. We're doing our best, we're all doing our best. I'm excited that we're here having this family talk today because you're here trying to do your best. 
We're all here trying to do our best. And as we do, God will breathe on that. God will breathe his spirit upon us and upon what he's calling us to do. And we're going to continue to learn and we're going to continue to grow. And we're going to step into the words of Nehemiah and we're going to answer the question, who cares? Our school continues to grow. The school, this school year we're in, we added 150 students on top of the 200 that we grew back the year prior. So now we're 150 stronger than we were before COVID came. We're on track in where we're going through this end of this school year and into the summer to add another 150 next year. These are our goals and our team is engaged in that effort. We're having tremendous interest in our school continuously. People coming to learn more about it and want to be a part of it. And we're having that momentum and we're really grateful for it. Our team is strong and focused. At the same time, we're working to make up significant financial challenges that these last two years have caused. Last fall, we leaned into a fundraising campaign. We talked about it for a month in October and into November called Rise as One. We had good response, but simply not the level of response to fill that gap. And we continue to press into the Rise as One opportunity and our school leaders are doing the same. We're making it a very broad appeal and approach and we'll continue to step into Rising as One. We still have some room to go to fill the gap. This has led to a necessary effort to downsize our overhead. And these are things that we do in, in the office, we do with our leaders, we do with our elders. And then there's a time where it's a time for me to share it more broadly with you. Try to be careful to keep it in the right perspective and keep it in the right place where these things are processed. Then it's important for us as a family to have a family understanding. So we've walked through the last month of actually having a tremendous effort to downsize our overhead. In September this last fall, our CFO resigned unexpectedly and concluded his time with us in early November. This led to Travis Brown stepping into the CFO role and he's leading our organization currently in the process of a financial reset. Travis had been overseeing special projects here in our office contracted to serve the solar panels that we have in our parking lot. He oversaw that project, brought that about as a tremendous effort that is a savings going forward for many years to come. He's been overseeing the re-roofing projects of all of our buildings that are now 40 some years old and we're re-roofing everything. He's overseeing that project, all the HVAC units. He's had tremendous skills in that and he was available to step into the CFO role in this transition and Travis has been doing a tremendous job guiding us in this effort. In the month of December, we reduced our overhead by $120,000 a month. Think of that, that's a significant effort to get us where we need to go and it's on the right path, yet there's still more that's needed. We accomplished this through salary reductions, which I personally led the way in, through attrition by not having, not hiring for personnel that might move from out of state, things of that kind. Sometimes there's transitions like that. We simply haven't backfilled. We've also had a few layoffs. Those are the things that we work at doing last. Those are the worst things ever to do when someone is affected in their family by a decision of that kind. It's the worst possible step to take, yet we've had to do that as well in a few situations. And none of them were related to performance issues, simply by necessity and finding what we needed to do to continue to reach the point of financial health in the journey that we're on. We love each and every one that's a part of our team. And sometimes those challenges have come our way. This leads us to where we are today. It's a new year. 
The vision is clear. We're pressing in with our whole heart and soul to all that God has in store. There is a world to reach with the message of his love and grace. You're here. You're a part of a healthy church that is willing to work together to see the future become greater than our past. I'd like to say that again. You're here as we work together to see the future become greater than our past. And we have an amazing past, which we are grateful for. We celebrate our past. We celebrate our history, but we're not living in the past and we're not going to stop because we've had some setbacks, because we've had some challenges. We've had things come our way nobody can control. And we know that God will see us through the challenges that come. Whether we made every decision right or not, that will be known in eternity one day. I do know we're doing our best. Every day and every step that we take together, we will always do our best. As we rebuild our church family, we'll continue to fulfill our vision, to live as Jesus among the broken, through word and deed, telling people about Jesus and teaching them to follow him. This is our mission. We baptized eight more people last week. In December, we had baptized 16 before the end of the year. We're seeing souls come to Jesus. It's about the fulfillment of our mission. Wednesday night, we begin a new season for our men's and women's ministry and youth and children's ministry with a couple venue changes. I want to mention this to you. The women will meet in the chapel. The men will meet in the parlor on Wednesday night. Our youth are going to move to the fireside room and to A24. This Wednesday, they'll meet together, middle and high school. And then in the weeks going forward, our high school will meet in the fireside room, our middle school in a24 and we have an opportunity to build our youth ministry and our children's ministry meets in the activity center we're going to maximize the spaces that we have and we're making a few transitions toward that opportunities for growth are in front of us opportunities for serving are in front of us in fact if you would like to serve in youth ministry there's an opportunity to help in small groups to help our youth leaders Trent Ellerman is stepping into our high school ministry. Johnny Benzuelo is a tremendous leader in our middle school ministry. They're teaming up, but we can use help. If you want to help, there's a kiosk in the lobby where you can learn more about volunteering for youth ministry on Sundays or Wednesdays. Restored is the word for this year of 2023. Restored to the impact God intends for us to have in our community. Restored to the vision of capital through growth in our church. Restored to financial health through innovative business practices. A growing enrollment in the school. Advancement of ways that we can add revenues to fill the gap at the school. And a growing and generous congregation of Jesus followers. One of the things that I can say thankfully to you and about you is that you've remained faithful Our giving exceeds the losses that we've had in how many people attend. We do better than we should because of the heart of generosity that is in you and in us together. Have you ever faced challenges that seemed overwhelming that made you wonder if you could keep going? I talk to people often that are going through incredible hardships job situations, family losses, great, great challenges. What happens when you feel like you're getting weary? Have you ever felt like just throwing in the towel? Nehemiah is going to show us how to keep going when it seems like there's great challenges on the horizon. Did you know that Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor for lack of ideas? And that he also went bankrupt more than once until he built Disneyland. What if he would have quit? He persevered through it. Did you know that in 1954, Jim Denny, the manager of the Grand Ole Opry, fired Elvis Presley after one performance? He said to Elvis, you ain't going nowhere, son. You ought to go back to driving a truck. 
What if Elvis, Elvis would have listened? Some people think he's still alive somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Did you know that it took Thomas Edison 2,000 experiments before he invented the right filament for the first light bulb? Edison said, I never failed once. Inventing the light bulb just happened to be a 2,000 step process. And there's a way to look at life. What do you do? It's time to be restored. It's time to move forward. It's time to say, who cares? What can I do to help? Did you know that Jonas Salk, the man who invented the vaccine for polio, yes, I'm going to mention a vaccine attempted 200 unsuccessful vaccines before he came up with the one that worked. And do you know that one that worked has eliminated polio entirely from debilitating humans and killing people? Because somebody said, I'm not gonna give up. His response to being accused of failure was, I simply found 200 ways not to make a vaccine for polio. Now, it's transformed the world. Do you know there are 10 major diseases that have been eliminated by medicine, by vaccines? Thank God for them. Nehemiah learned that the walls around Jerusalem were broken down and the gates burned. Any enemy could just walk in and plunder the city at will. The people were in jeopardy. Without walls, God's people had little means of protection Nehemiah determined he needed to do something. He wasn't a construction guy. He was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes in Persia. He was in a palace. He knew wine. He knew how to make sure that it wasn't poisoned for the king. He actually lived a life of luxury. He didn't need to have a change of venue. He was living in a palace a thousand miles from Jerusalem. It would take him three months to get from where he was to Jerusalem. And yet those were his people. And he was hearing about the problem. He was hearing about the burden and God put something in his heart that said, I need to do something about this. Who cares? Nehemiah found that he did. George Bernard Shaw wrote, the worst sin toward our fellow creatures is not to hate them, but to be indifferent to them. That's the essence of inhumanity. One of the ways that God wants us to rebuild, one of the ways he wants us to be restored is that we care. We care about every soul. We care about every person. We care about finding unity among Diversity, we find that God wants us to do something that others may not have an interest in doing. Let's treat everybody with dignity. Let's treat everybody as equal. Let's treat everyone as a child of God that are created in his image. Let's treat everyone as if they matter because they do. I've been driving up to the church every day and often I'll stop my car in the driveway before I get to my parking space and just watch the sign slides on our digital sign rotate. One of them that's been rotating this week has almost looks like confusion on the screen, just a bunch of words in dark letters and then the same words are highlighted in white letters in the middle of it and it simply says, you matter. You matter. The hope is that somebody drives by and sees that and says, Maybe I do, because it's true. If there's a body of people that can treat everyone as if they matter, not despising the people who aren't like us, not getting against the people who don't think the way we do, not saying, I don't like that, I'm moving on, but saying, no, I care and I'm gonna move in. I'm gonna say, what can I do to help? What can I do to make a difference? This is the heart of Nehemiah. When others are in trouble, who cares? When challenges mount, who cares? Nehemiah was the kind of person who cared even though he lived hundreds of miles away from trouble, even though he was successful and secure in his own life. 
even though it was not his fault that his ancestors were in jeopardy. Nehemiah cared more about others than himself. Some people don't care when they hear that others are in trouble. As long as it's not happening to them, what concern is it to me? So let's read the first chapter of Nehemiah, and I'm going to hasten to conclusion. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as it was in Susa the citadel, that Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. Even if we have failed, even if we have wandered, if we return to him, he says, good to go. I'm going to bring everybody back. I'm going to heal everybody. I'm going to bring health out of brokenness. I'm going to cause everything to go in the right direction again. Our failures do not amount to our destiny. No, our return to God and saying, I believe in you and I believe what you can do for me. I'm coming back to you. And he says, all right, let's go. I'm going to make your way straight. Where did I stop? Is it on the screen? <laughs> Did I read that verse? Okay, let's go to verse 10 then. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He ends by saying what his job was. Now I was cupbearer to the king. He's moving away from a life of ease, a life of luxury, to a life of sacrifice, to a life of challenge because he cared. The question got asked of him, who cares? And he said, I do. And he was moved on until he moved out. Nehemiah expressed his caring heart in three ways. One, he prayed. This is the first of 12 prayers recorded in the book of Nehemiah. He was a man of prayer. What are we? We're people of prayer. We had an awesome prayer meeting Wednesday night. It's in the middle of a big storm. And we're seeing God do some great things. This week has been an actual call to prayer for all of America in the most unusual of ways through a tragedy in a football game on Monday night when an athlete went down with cardiac arrest in the first quarter of a football game and all of the players gathered around and got on their knees and prayed. <clears throat> when an ESPN sportscaster that was trying to talk through the situation in the moment, Dan Orlovsky said, you know, 
We should pray and said, since we should, why don't we pray right now? And on national television, on ESPN, he begins to call out to God the most beautiful of prayers while the people on set agreed and at the end said amen and thanked him for praying. Nobody's pushing back on prayer today. And that young man who went into cardiac arrest, who got resuscitated on the field through CPR and through defibrillation, in critical condition, with the whole country praying for him, with people asking God to help him out, has come out. And he's in critical condition yet, but he's now has all of his neurological functions. He's beginning to talk. Some miracles are happening. I just caught a news flash today that the game that his, his team was playing today, the opening kickoff, one of his teammates ran back the opening kickoff for a touchdown on the opening play of the game for the team that he's from. It's like God's doing something. That felt like a supernatural <laughs> act of God's grace too. Like it doesn't happen very often. There's prayer. Yeah. We're praying. We need to be people of prayer. Pastor Julian, our children's pastor, sister had a seizure and she went into cardiac arrest this week. We began praying for her. And we've learned that she's recovering. She's about to get released from the hospital, possibly today, tomorrow, coming back from the brink of near death. And we prayed, we prayed on Wednesday night for all these things and God wants to do some great things. It's just signs of his power and what he wants to do. We're people of prayer. Nehemiah said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. That's us. We love him and we want to do his will. To what kind of God do we pray when we lift our voices? We pray to the God of heaven. We pray to the God who cares. We pray to the God who is able to do supernatural things, who keeps his word. Another thing that Nehemiah did was he expressed passion. He, he went to prayer and then he expressed passion. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. That's passion. He wasn't passive, he was passionate. When God puts a concern on our hearts, let's not run from it. Let our tears actually Water the soil that will bear forth some incredible fruit because we care, because it matters, because we're all in. When passion is missing in our lives, we face the possibility of a fruitless life. We need passion so that the soil stays rich and ready to bear forth fruit. The book of Nehemiah begins with great trouble, but before it closes, there is great joy. And then... Nehemiah chose to participate. He went to prayer. He expressed passion. And he said, I'm all in and I'm going to participate. I'm not going to stay back on the sidelines. I'm going to do what I can do. I wasn't thinking about this, but I just shared briefly in the room off to the side before we came in with our team, just what we're talking about today. And I shared these three P's. Prayer, passion, and participation. And my son-in-law says to me, the PPP. We had a PPP loan to help us through. Now we don't need a loan. We need prayer, passion, and participation in those three Ps, PPP. These are the things that are going to get us where we need to go from here. With God's help, we're going to participate Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 11, O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. God has chosen to get his work done on earth through his people. Therefore, he's looking for those who will be available for him to use. Often when God answers prayer, he begins by working in the one doing the praying. 
He's calling us. He's calling you. He's saying, who cares? We're here today on a mission. We're here today on purpose. We're here today because it's beautiful, because there's an opportunity of what God wants to do through this house where he's called us together to serve together, to make a difference in this world. And we're here to pray, we're here to be passionate, and we're here to participate. And as we do, some things are gonna break out, some miracles are gonna happen, some breakthroughs are coming, the rebuilding of the walls are being done, and God is gonna be glorified, and the latter end will be greater than the former. In 52 days, the walls were rebuilt. The gates were restored and the people were rejoicing. And it all started with one man who cared. God is still looking for people who care enough to pray, express passion, and participate in the solution. Thank you, God, for this house. Thank you for your people. Thank you for you that we're here, not on our own. We're here because of you and your love. We're here because of your passion, the passion of the Christ, who prayed, who wept over us, who sweat great drops of blood in anxious moments and anxiety, knowing of what you would face. Thank you for your passion, your sacrifice, your participation so that we could have hope in life, eternal life.